Hello everyone! We're reaching the end of the year, so this will be the last official Q&A for the year 2014. Let's try to make it a good one, shall we? Starting off with... Nobble! Who is Lothar? Please answer. Anduin Lothar, he was a hero of the Alliance during the first Horde invasion. In his youth, he became friends with the Guardian Medivh and the future King of Stormwinds, Lane Rin. And Lane Rin is the father to Varian Rin. He joined Stormwinds military, he became part of the King's Honor Guard, and he became an official knight. Now as you might know, Medivh he was corrupted by Sargeras, and it was he who created the Dark Portal on Azeroth's side, and he let the Orcish Horde in. Medivh's apprentice Ketgar, he found out about Medivh's betrayal, and together with Lothar and Corona half Orkan, they took on the corrupted Guardian, and they decapitated him. This did not stop the Orcish invasion though, the Orcs were already on the planet, but Stormwind did its best to hold the line while waiting for reinforcements. For her bravery and loyalty to the humans, Garona she was offered a spot at High Court, but a spell placed in her mind by Gul'dan forced her to betray them all, and Garona, against her will, assassinated the King of Stormwind. Gul'dan is bringing up his warlocks by nightfall. Until then... The Black Rock Clan will be trying to take the Eastern Wall. A thousand deaths. We will hold until the reinforcements come. As long as men with stout hearts are manning the walls and the throne, Stormwind will hold. The Orc leaders agree with your assessment. With their king murdered, Stormwind quickly fell, and Lothar took as many as he could, and he set sail to the land of Lordaeron. There, he warned the nobles of Lordaeron about the threat of the Horde, and thankfully they listened, and they took him seriously. They formed the first alliance, they battled against the Horde while gaining more allies, and eventually, they pushed the Horde back from the capital city, all the way back to Blackrock Mountain. There they faced off against the Horde and their war chief Orgrim Doomhammer. Lothar was older than Doomhammer, but what he lacked in youth he made up with experience, and an epic battle between the two honorable leaders followed. It was a great battle, Lothar gave it his all, but the Doomhammer it shattered his weapon and it crushed his skull. Orgrim thought that the Alliance would bow down after seeing their commander defeated, but quite the opposite happened. Trellion saw his friend the commander fall, he found his faith in the light and he kicked the crap out of Orgrim. This sent the Horde forces fleeing and this allowed Ketgar to close the Dark Portal. Now those that fought with Lothar against the third Horde invasion, they became known as the Sons of Lothar. Hi Noble, love your vids. I have a question and I wondered about something. Question, where is the Exodar and Tempest Keep in Warlords of Draenor? The other thing, what do you think about the new profession system? I feel cheated, as I have mining on my main character, and now that everybody can mine, I feel that all my mining work has been for nothing. Greetings from Norway. The Exodar and the Tempest Keep as a whole, they were not always near Draenor as we see it in Outland. They were summoned by Khadgar, who was stuck in Outland at the time, and this was after the events of Beyond the Dark Portal. The Burning Legion, it was closing in all around them, so Khadgar, he used his magic to reach out in the Great Dark Beyond. The Great Dark Beyond, or the Great Dark, is what they use to describe unexplored or unexplained areas in Warcraft, and in the Great Dark, Khadgar made contact with Adal and the Naru. He convinced them to come to Outland to help them out and this is what brought the Tempest Keep and all these vessels that we see, this is what brought it to Outland. Now I don't know what the story might bring in Warlords of Draenor, but perhaps Khadgar or someone else will find a way to contact Alternate Adal and we might see the Tempest Keep in a future patch. It seems unlikely in my opinion, but who knows what the future might bring. Now for your second question, I'm not that into professions to be honest, but I don't really see a problem with having these resources nearby and available for everyone. The materials you get without the profession, so the materials just in your garrison are not a whole lot, and besides that, it's now so easy to level up alts that most people have all the professions covered anyways. You still have a benefit if you have the profession, since you can simply gather a lot more nodes and materials during the day, and... Yeah, I, I honestly don't really see a problem with it. Why are there goblins in the Iron Horde? Did they come from Draenor 2? And was Draenor also called like that before the Draenei came? Draenor was not always called Draenor, but the orcs at the time, they didn't really have a name for the planet. They liked the name that the Draenei had given it, the name Draenor, so they too started to call the planet Draenor. 
I'm not exactly sure where the goblins of the Iron Horde come from. I would imagine that during the time period of the Red Portal opening up and us destroying it, between that time period, several made their way to the planet to make a nice little profit. They could have also joined the Iron Horde during the time that we stormed the portal, that they sneaked in with us, but I didn't really see any goblins during all of these events. Another explanation could be that they found a portal of their own to come to Draenor, since portals they do seem to be popping up all over the place, but that's just my explanation. I don't believe Blizzard has given an official reason, and you can give your own explanation if you want to. Hey Noble, I was wondering what do you plan on doing when WoW's life runs out? Will you still make lore videos? I'm sure you'll still have a backlog of thousands of subjects, but I'm just interested to know how the end of WoW will affect your life. I thought about this question a couple of times and you're absolutely right, there are still plenty of stories left to tell and this will probably take me a few years to get done. I don't see Blizzard giving up the Warcraft franchise, so even if World of Warcraft would end, I'd imagine that we were to get a Warcraft 4 or perhaps we get another movie or something else that might show up, I just don't see Warcraft dying out. Now say that Warcraft does completely vanish and I've told all the stories that are left to tell, I figure that we'll just cross the bridge when we get there. I'm pretty sure that I won't stop making videos since I still love making videos, but perhaps they'll be about different subjects. Perhaps they'll be a brand new MMO that has conquered the market. Or perhaps I'll do Starcraft or Diablo or Zelda or Game of Thrones or... You know, there are so many topics that I could tell stories about, but for now there's still plenty of tell about Warcraft. We'll see what the future is going to bring. Hi Noble. Love your vids. I'm playing Warlords of Draenor and I really like it. What do you think about this expansion and which was your favorite zone? Keep up the great work, smiley face. Now it's very hard for me to pick a favorite zone because all of them they had like their own character, their own atmosphere and Blizzard has done a bang up job with the different zones. But if I had to pick, I'll go with the two starting zones, namely Frostfire Ridge and Shadowmoon Valley. Both of them had an amazing story in my opinion. I love the atmosphere, I love the music, the way it all looked, and I'm still salty about not getting our capital cities in these zones. So far, I really enjoy Warlords of Draenor, but at the same time I'm also hoping that a patch is coming in the near future. As most of you know, I'm not a massive raider. I'm not a hardcore PvPer, which leaves me with not that much left to do. Some might argue that it's my own fault, since I stay away from the two major things to do in-game, and you're absolutely right, that's my own thing, but I'm still hoping that we'll get additional content like we got during Mr. Pandaria. For example, I wouldn't say no to a revamp of the Brawler's Guild, a couple of new bosses and new fights, or maybe we'll get some more pet battles to go in, or maybe we'll get a couple of scenarios, maybe... Something else, I would just like to see additional content besides the endgame raiding and the endgame PvP. Especially since LFR is just, you know, you go in, you smack something for half an hour, you go out again. I'm just looking for something extra. Now that said, I did really enjoy the fights that I was able to do on normal. I've done uh, Kargov, I've done the Butcher, I've tried to take down the Earth thingy and the uh, Magical Ogre thingy. We didn't get those two down, but the battles that I have seen, they looked amazing and they did a fantastic job. Hopefully I'll be able to get some more raiding in later on in the expansion. And like I said, I would love to see more additional content. Hey Noble, I saw a theory on the WoW forums the other day that I wanted to ask you about. Do you think the red mist that turned the Draenei into broken in our timeline has something to do with the blood of Sefe? On Draenor, we see how the blood similarly affects the Arakoa that are cast into it, from Palmy. Palmy, I tried to find a conversation we had about this on Twitter, it was like half a year ago, but sadly I couldn't find it. What I do remember is that they confirmed that the Red Mist used in this story, and for those that don't know, the Red Mist was used by the Burning Legion against the Draenei, this disconnected the Draenei from the light, and on top of that it also devolved them into broken and into lost ones. A good example of this is, for example, Nobundo or uh, Akama that we've seen during the Black Temple, those two were both affected by the Red Mist. Now they've confirmed that this was a weapon from the Legion and they only used it during the war against the Draenei. In my opinion it's very strange that they wouldn't use such a powerful weapon that has the ability to actually disconnect people from the light more often, but you know, there you go, that was just a, uh, you know, story device that they used only in Nobundo storyline, only for the Broken and Lost Ones, and it doesn't seem to be connected to Sefer. Sefer does indeed change the Arakoa, you're absolutely right about that, but there are multiple things in the lore that can change things. So I wouldn't say that the one is the same as the other. I don't think that the rest mist is connected to the blood. And this brings us to the final question. 
I'm curious about Yurul. What is her story and what is your opinion of her? Is she a good addition to the lore? I always like it when Blizzard adds a female hero. Is she competent enough to stand up to her other female counterparts in terms of interesting story? Thanks Noble, love your videos. Now we're still learning about Yurl and I'll either cover her story as we go or I'll make a full story of once it's all said and done. So far, her story in a nutshell is she's captured by the Iron Hordes, she's liberated by us and then she turns from someone who was happy to just help out in the temple to someone who's kicking ass and taking names. There's still a very much story left to learn and her description on the WoW website says that she has some sort of dark secrets so who knows what the future will bring. There's also a garrison campaign where you're going to get some additional storyline with Euro, but I'm not entirely sure if it's available on live yet so I'm, I won't be going into further details to avoid spoilers. If you want to know what's going to happen I'll link a video in the description. Now to your question, is she a good addition to the lore? This is purely my opinion, so take that as it is. I freaking love what they've done with Euro. We finally have a new Alliance hero that is actually a badass in the cinematics, and I can't wait to see where they're going to take her. I really hope that they don't kill her off, that would be such a waste of character development, but time will tell what her story is going to bring. To your other question, uh, is she on par with the other female characters in the story? Uh, in my opinion, she surpasses all of them. Warcraft, it doesn't have that many female heroes, and those that we do have, they either end up as arm candy, they go crazy, or they simply disappear. Take Verisa, for example. She became known as Rona's girlfriend. Maiev, she turned crazy. Valera, she disappeared. Illyria became Trellian's girlfriend and disappeared. The list goes on and on, to be honest, and the one that might be at the same level of Euro is Jaina Proudmoore, but they only developed her recently. Before Mr. Pandaria, Jaina could be found crying in House Crown, she could be found crying at Thrall's wedding, but now they turned her from this, this peacekeeper just let the world trample all over her to this badass character that simply had enough. Unfortunately, the game didn't complete the story since some major events were locked away in novels like Tides of War and War Crimes. And in my opinion, this is a real shame since the game only paints half a picture. Now people actually call Jaina crazy, they call her a dreadlord and... You know, there, there's more story to be told, and that was locked in the novels. Now with Euro, I still have high hopes, and I believe that Blizzard actually listened to the fans. There were some data mined conversations between Euro and Marat, and they implied that there would be some sort of romantic relation between the two, and the feedback was that people, they didn't want another female hero to be turned into arm candy. Now don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong about a female character having a love interest, that's actually rather beautiful, it's just that... Warcraft has never been able to really develop both a relationship and a good character. Like I said, so many female heroes already turn into arm candy. Once they're hooked up, they kind of go to the background of the story. And that's a real shame, because it's not impossible to write both. It's not impossible to be a hero as well as having a relationship. The only one I can think of is the Jaina Caligos relationship, but that's also a little bit rocky and you don't really hear about that in-game. So yeah, long story short, I'm very happy with what they did with Euro, and I can't wait to see more of this badass character. I see now. You never belonged with us, Dorota. Our bond is iron. But you are so <laughs> what do you want, little girl? Your head. Cannon is in position! On your command. Prepare to fire. Such arrogance to believe that you alone could defeat me!
And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to end the final Q&A for 2014. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. And remember, if you have questions, you can always send them in over at ask.fm or you can leave a comment down below and I might use it in the next video. Once again, thank you everybody for watching. Subscribe if you like my videos. And until next time, guys. See ya!